Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we are joined by Bruce Director from the LaRouche Foundation. Uh, and I don't know how many people watched that debate last night. I would imagine is in many millions. Uh, I don't know if some of the people involved really realized just how badly managed this was by Candy Crowley. But uh, Obama was evasive on the issue of Libya. He was evasive on every issue. He tried to act aggressive, but he really was uh, not acting presidential in any way. And when you look at uh, Obama's behavior and his mistakes uh, in terms of factual issues over, say, drilling in uh, oil and, and coal permits, etc., uh, Obama is, from one end to the other, just lying. And he, he's just, there's no substance there. So I don't know, Bruce, what do you think of the debate last night? Well, uh, I think your characterization is not a bad one. Um, I think See, that, I'm uh, sure you can expand on it. Uh, tell us what else you think, because I, I, it's disturbing to me that we have media side trying to say that Obama won the debate. Which I think, are you talking about a, a kind of a street fight where people just get aggressive? Because I didn't see Obama winning at any points. None. Well, the media, the media I, I just, was desperate to spin this thing to save the collapse of the Obama presidency. Uh, what came out in the first debate was Obama's personality. Remember that LaRouche back in April of 2009, after Obama had only been in office for three months, uh, identified what Obama's essential problem was, which is his personality. He has a Nero complex. And a lot right. of people, you know, LaRouche did this before the election as well. He warned people, you know, don't, don't go for Obama uh, instead of Hillary Clinton because Obama is a faker with a big ego and he's a, he's, he's a hollow suit. The guy has no brains. He's just a puppet for Wall Street and British financial interests. And when Obama came into the presidency, LaRouche gave him a few months to see if he could get his act together. And some people around Obama had made some overtures that said, well, we'll be interested in listening to your ideas. But within, within a few months, after the beginning of April, when Obama went over to England and kissed the Queen and, and uh, talked about how much he loved the Queen of England, it was clear that this guy was, uh, was what we thought he was, which is a Nero who's only goal was to basically destroy the nation on behalf of the British Empire. He's not the leader of yeah. it, he's just the guy who does it. But but that that is that is what Obama is. He can't change that. No amount of coaching or debate preparation is going to change that. And he's always been protected by his teleprompter, by his adoring fans. If he, you put him in a in a in a room with the right lights and the adoring fans and even in the white house where he has valerie jarrett and his wife and all these people to butter him up you know a man with that kind of ego can appear to function but when you put him on a stage like in the first debate as romney did and and call him what he is a liar uh... you know a phony a faker uh, well, romney didn't necessarily use those words but that's what came out and obama's yeah. personality he was more, more gentleman yeah, he was more gentlemanly about it, but I saw Romney as acting presidential, and I saw uh, Obama as acting like a uh, street fighter. Well, the personality of Obama came out, and he didn't like being challenged, and and Candy Crowley did have to rehabilitate him on several points where he got you know into a corner on his lies, like around Libya, where Obama just blatantly lied that that he had he had called this an act of terror when it's not true. And, and, and he also, Obama lied by saying this was, he takes responsibility. Well, that's the first time, last night was the first time he said he takes responsibility. Up till now, he's tried to t break the arm of Hillary Clinton to get her to fall on the sword for him. And I, right. I think that, you know, that, that is really unseemly, because the fact of the matter is, is that Obama is responsible for the deaths of those people in Libya. He's the one who... You know, went uh, right. started the whole thing with the Libyan war. He's the one who brought in Al Qaeda. He's the one no, who I'm wanted sure to go He was in. This, I'm sure he was in the Situation Room because it was apparently five days before when the wall was breached, which means there was a planned terrorist attack, and uh, they refused to give upgraded security. So that decision, I'm sure, when he was in the Situation Room, was right there for Obama. Of course, and 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 he knew that. They knew. They knew. 24 hours, the C Congressional Intelligence Committees have already said they were briefed 24 hours uh, on September 12th 
uh, that there was no demonstration. The, the security video already showed that. The eyewitness accounts already showed that. There was no demonstration. And yet the president and his, and his U.N. ambassador and his press secretary and everybody else went out to the American people and said this was uh, uh, the effect of a riot uh, over a video that had been posted in July, when in fact, uh, as was known at that time and now, you know, fully confirmed, that al-Qaeda uh, operatives were pouring across the border from Egypt into Libya for the express purpose of carrying out an attack on the consulate in Benghazi uh, on September 11th. Right, they wanted to have it on an anniversary of a date of the 9-11 event 11 years earlier. That's why they were there. Well, and remember that the 9-11 event was not done... Who, who did that? And LaRouche, again, was was uh, right on the mark on that one because 9-11-2001 was carried out by the British and Saudi monarchies. They're not any different. The Saudi monarchy was created by the British monarchy. And right, they were integrated. Sort of, they... Yeah, if you, if you know the real history, the British were the ones that appointed the Sauds as the leading family. They weren't the, the lineal kings of Saudi Arabia. They are the no, ones they, that were, yeah. They, they broke them up. They broke up the Ottoman, when the Ottoman Empire broke up, the British and the French divided up the so-called Middle East according to their various imperial designs. And they brought, the British brought the, the, the House of Saud in there. And, and, and to this day, the Saudis fund the British Empire. They fund the British monarchy through the oil revenues and and the finances, and they keep the British banks afloat. But they, LaRouche warned that going into 2001, the global economy was collapsing, and that in a period of collapse, uh, the empires always go for dictatorship. And when Bush was George Bush, uh, the younger was was uh, uh, appointed president by the Supreme Court. Um, and put uh, Cheney in there as his vice president, LaRouche said in, in January of 2001, even before Bush was inaugurated, he said, I know what this administration is. He said, Bush, Bush Younger is, is an idiot, but he's like a Hitler. And what will happen is they will look for some pretext, uh, like Hitler did with the Reichstag fire, where the, right. the, the, the German parliament was burned down a month after Hitler was appointed chancellor, and then that became a pretext for Hitler to get through enabling legislation in the German parliament, which basically made him effectively dictator. And LaRouche says, that's what's going to happen in the United States. This was in January 2001. Well, what happened in, in, in September 2001, September 11th, was the British Empire carried out an attack. These were all, all Saudis. These were people associated with... Um, the uh, former ambassador to the United States, Prince Bandar, who's now the head of the, the Saudi intelligence services. Uh, during the 9-11, in the uh, days following 9-11, when there was an a all-out ban on all flights, uh, airspace in the United States for more than a week, the only flight which, which traveled and left the United States was a private jet carrying uh, members of Bandar and, and Saudi families and, and the bin Laden family. These were personal friends of the Bushes. So they're the ones who carried it out. There's 28 pages in the 9-11 Commission report, which Bush refused to declassify. When Obama was running for office, he promised the families of the victims of 9-11 that he would declassify these 28 pages. And to this day, he still hasn't declassified them because he's covering up for the same bunch. And... Uh, uh, that's what happened. After 9-11, they got enabling legislation through the, the um, uh, Patriot Act and all the foreign uh, surveillance and all this stuff you and your uh, uh, listeners exactly. know. Exactly. Yeah, Patriot Act and all the other pieces of Patriot Act 2 and 3, all the way to the 923 executive orders of the abomination administration. Right. Now Obama has... Uh, Put on the uh, NDAA where he wants to detain citizens without a cause. Exactly. Back in a moment with Bruce Director. Welcome back to 
to the Nutramedical Report with Bruce Director from the LaRouche Foundation. That's LaRouchePAC.com. Uh, and the Executive Intelligence Review is LaRouchePUB.com. Just want to make a statement. Yesterday I read the paper that the State Department is now trying to apologize. Not dealing, by the way, with the Megazi disaster, which they purposely caused because five days before there was a breach in the wall of the compound. There was a request for increased security. That was denied. They were told them they were going to only contract with Iraqi, with the Libyan and British security forces if they would carry no bullets. So they purposely also allowed, they were monitoring everything. They knew, knew that the ambassador, even his uh, jogging route was being put up on a YouTube page that Al-Qaeda had access to. Uh, they were setting him out basically as a uh, brown shirt because remember that uh, this ambassador was involved with the quote, regime change. And I think you probably knew too much. Now, what's happening is they're now apologizing, saying, oh, gee, most of the weapons we're providing and intelligence and other technologies uh, are ending up in the hands of bad guys. We don't want them to have the weapons, most of the weapons. So now the State Department is trying to say, well, gee, we're trying to make sure the weapons just get in the real you know, Syrian Free Army that are really Syrians, not people from Qatar and other places. They're actually graduates of Libya and Tunisia. They're actually terrorists or people hired hired uh, mercenaries to come in there. Uh, this is a ridiculous administration, the Obama administration, and his literally apologizing us backward into a regional war that's going to get way out of hand and could get out of hand as early as this week or next week because we now have had shelling of Syria, probably started by one of their own false flags from the uh, uh, so-called Syrian Free Army, into a Turkish village, and now the situation is is at the point where they're now down, you know, bringing down commercial jets, their Syrian jets, and Syria has likewise blocked uh, transport of of, uh, of Turkish uh, jets. There's a lot of people, by the way, that go back and forth because there's a lot of populations that share ancestry and relatives, etc., across the Turkish border in Syria. This is the stupidest situation possible in the midst of a situation that could close off the Strait of Hormuz, that, by the way, even with our best Navy, uh, if they just had one Iranian ship, because you now have an embargo, one Iranian ship, a uh, fast boat, could drop a couple of these high-tech uh, depth charges, and it would be the end of the Strait for a year. Our best Navy would take a year to clear those out of there, and the price of oil would go through the ceiling, and the economy of the world would collapse. Uh, Bruce, tell us what your analysis of what's going on, because Obama is beyond stupid. What they're doing is actually trying to precipitate a regional war which could become global and a collapse of the world economy, a complete full-stop cardiac arrest. Well, Obama's a puppet. you got to remember that. He's, he's a, yeah, I know. Uh, he's, a, he's the actor's gill puppet for the British banksters that now have run out of schemes for their current financial system, and now they've got QE3, so they're literally making uh, the Fed Reserve the piggy bank for the world because the ECB came out a week earlier than the Fed Reserve saying they're going to start QE3. I think it's all a big scheme to pump 40 to $80 billion a month more into this um, <coughs> this literally destruction by debt. Yeah, and quantitative eating for life. Yeah, it's ridiculous. And <laughs> Dewey infinity. Do it. Well, and of course, uh, I'm, I, I know Romney brought him to task on that, but people don't realize your pensions... Your 401ks, anything denominated in dollars, will be destroyed eventually. All money is going to be worthless because the dollar is the reserve currency, and and there it's already a hyperinflationary situation. The, the Fed is propping up the value of assets, paper assets, or right. they're not even paper anymore. They're basically electronic assets, and they're not worth anything. And if you were to withdraw the Fed support. Uh, these assets would go to zero, and so would the banks and everything else. So that's right. all finished. Now, what the British are trying to do in the empire is to say, well, we know it's all finished, and but we want to make sure that uh, as this thing unravels and collapse, we come out on top. And they've, you know, they have an ideological bent to also reduce the population. And one of the right. fastest ways to reduce the population would be to get a nuclear confrontation. Well, besides uh, that, what's happening, just the speculation, where this money is going to go, $80 billion, is going to go into speculation on mortgage-backed securities, which they haven't stopped. So my good mortgage will be thrown in with bad mortgages, etc. They'll be thrown in this giant debt pot that will be literally circulated to the entire planet, interlocking all debt. As they qu print more and more money, it goes from 87% of all world currencies are in, either in physical dollars or electronic dollars, U.S. dollars. And eventually, there will be not only the support for the ECB, 
but they'll force the Chinese and the Russians and everybody to have use the Federal Reserve as a World Reserve Bank. <clears throat> this is very well, dangerous. Well, that's where the because, competition comes in. Because right, the Russians yeah. and the Chinese are not going to go along with that. The Russians and the Chinese, uh, for all their problems, have some resources, and they are committed as a, a government in both cases for with different complications, but they're committed towards developing and expanding their countries. They are not going to uh, accede to the uh, integrating themselves into the British Empire. Now, Obama is, an, is a narcissist who believes he's the one who could force Britain, uh, China, and Russia to uh, accede to the British demands, but they're not going to do it. And the problem is, if you push them to do it, you're going to end up increasing tensions to the point where, uh, out of the blue, you get a nuclear thermonuclear exchange. Look, yeah. the, this, is what, this is what the original Libya war was about. The French and the British working in front, but Obama in behind the scenes. Remember Obama talked about leading from behind? He was, right. he was the one who was pushing it. He pushed the Libya war for the purpose of... Get, getting uh, getting rid of Gaddafi, and they killed Gaddafi because they then wanted to exp extend the war into Syria. And the reason why they wanted to extend it into Syria was because they wanted a direct confrontation with Russia and China, and then they wanted to extend it into Iran. Now, it hasn't happened because the Joint Chiefs of Staff of the United States, the Russian military, and the Chinese military and Chinese governments have all said, you know, look, we military guys, we're the commanders. We know what nuclear war is, and we know that, that Obama is trying to create a pretext for a confrontation uh, to get us to back down, and we we got to get together and stop this. The only sure way you have to stop this thing is to get Obama out. You take the right. example you mentioned earlier about the Syrian, uh, the Russian flight that was that was uh, forced yeah, there's down. Been more, than, more than one now. There's been two flights right. that have been. And but by the these way, these were done on orders of the United States. They were not done. Right. They were not. <clears throat> the Turks did not down. Did not bring that Russian plane down. That plane was brought down by orders of the United States. The United States, the Obama administration, are the ones who told the Turks, planted the false information that there was. Um, uh, contraband on the plane and forced it down because the Obama administration wants to create a pretext to get Turkey into a confrontation with Syria because Turkey is a NATO country and then they can invoke Article 5 and that would be a pretext by which the United States would get sucked into that. Well, Our military guys they... know this is a disaster. That's why Bob Gates, the former uh, defense secretary right. for both Bush and Obama, said, you know, a, a no-fly zone or an act of war in, in Syria would be a disaster. Martin uh, Dempsey, the Joint Chiefs of Staff, uh, head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, said the same thing. Right. But Obama in fact, said, we, I know well, my military but, guys don't want this to happen, but I'm going to create a pretext by which it's going to have to happen anyway. The problem is that our Congress didn't impeach him before when he did this in Tunisia and in Libya, and that's why we're facing it again now with a pushing the envelope exactly. and manipulating behind the scenes to create a regional war which could become thermonuclear. Welcome back, and uh, the latest news I have from Reuters just a few hours ago, a Syrian envoy says bloodshed could engulf the Middle East. What's going on is Obama is trying to inflame a Sunni-Shiite war. It's primarily over, again, oil, which means that the new discoveries of oil in northern Iraq, which has now partitioned the state into northern Iraq or Kurdistan, because of the war, Syria has given free zone and free travel to the Kurds, that are in the adjacent Turkish areas. So Turkey basically is uh, inflaming a civil war that's been going on for decades against the Kurds, where they've been slaughtering them in eastern, southeastern Turkey. And now, of course, the northern uh, Iraq is now basically Kurdistan. Uh, that also includes, by the way, a good chunk of uh, northwestern Iran is also Kurdish. They uh, want to control, have eight times more oil than Saudi Arabia, proven already, and it's probably many times more than that. This is another oil war, and it's the oil war where America wants to control the whole situation again, which is why it's funded by Saudi Arabia. It's Israel, again, Mossad. There's evidence that they were directly trying to kill General Dempsey because he wouldn't agree to the policies of Netanyahu. 
Israel won't integrate its military forces with America. I mean, NATO, we can integrate with Britain and France and other NATO allies. Why not Israel? Because they want to act like a road nation and do whatever they want so we can wake up tomorrow morning and literally have a regional war with the Strait of Hormuz closed because the wacky Israelis think they can survive a preemptive attack on a live nuclear reactor and the counter-strike caused by chemical and biological weapons that will ultimately destroy the state of Israel. Uh, I think they're certifiably off the rocker. And what they'll do, as the Joint Chiefs have said in the 16 different agencies in an 82-page report just published a month ago, is that Israel is the greatest security risk for America. Now, I support the state of Israel so much as there should be, quote, an ally, but they're not acting like an ally. They do industrial espionage, they do military espionage, they will not integrate their forces, and they want to basically dictate, even during an election year, to the public of who they should support if they want to support a rogue policy by even a tiny fraction of Israel. Because most people in Israel, they had an internal revolt against the idea of a preemptive air attack against Iran. There's lots of other ways to deal this without starting a thermonuclear war which will haul in Russia and China, literally aiming missiles at our U.S. cities. This is craziness. Absolutely. But, but the, uh, the, the thing that uh, there's a very simple solution to this. You know, we don't really need to have war. It's very easy. If you got Obama out of there and you got a bipartisan government, there are people in the Democratic Party, there are people in the Republican Party who uh, know that LaRouche is right on this thing, and LaRouche is working hard to get these people together. You could uh, create a completely different uh, set of arrangements uh, internationally. First of all, Israel can't do anything without the United States. They want to be a rogue nation, but the United States can rein them in very easily. Yeah, because exactly. they totally depend on the United States for economically. So that, that problem can be dealt with quite easily. And then the United States could sit down with Russia and China and some of the other countries and say, look, what, what things, despite all our differences, what are the things that must be done for the common aims of mankind? Mankind's facing all kinds of threats. We're facing threats from uh, rogue asteroids from space. You know, there was just uh, earlier this month, on October 12th, a asteroid the size of a truck uh, passed 59,000 miles from uh, uh, within 59,000 miles of the Earth, between the Earth and the Moon. Now, the interesting thing is that they hadn't even we hadn't even ever seen this asteroid before until October 4th. So, right. We, we also have the government trying to hide data. As of May, they stopped releasing data on asteroid or sorry, comet. 2012 DA-14, it's 197 meters across, large enough to take out Luxembourg. And they keep recalculating closer and closer. It's 100,000 miles, you know, like half the lunar distance. And now it's down, as of May, to 5,000 miles over the surface of the Earth. And with a 1% chance, because of the error code, of an actual strike. We're talking about an object that's big enough to cause major climatic changes on the planet, to take out an area as large as Luxembourg in, in Europe, and yet, we don't have an integrated space program with Russia, China, etc. We should be scrambling to use all the scientific brains, technology, money, and resources to actually deal with this because it's rocks from space, it's space weather, it's coronal mass ejections that are going to end life on this planet. Or the stupidity of mankind that starts the nuclear war when there's no, the war and proxy wars are now obsolete. Right. And, and the point is, is that we have the opportunity, you know, we can, we can stop all this. Uh, you know, if you put the resources of the United States, Russia, China, the Europeans uh, together, we have an ability to um, set up monitoring stations in, um, uh, you know, around the Earth, out into the Mars orbit, and also between the Earth and Venus orbit. So we can look deep into space, and you, you, you know, if you're going to stop a, an asteroid or a comet or something hitting the Earth, you want to be able to to uh, deal with it when it's a long way away, so that you can launch a mission that will only um, uh, have to change its trajectory by a very small amount. Yeah, you could but, put, for example, a plasma engine or a solar plasma engine that is literally working over a period of decades, and it'll gradually push it out. You don't want to blow it up. What you want to do is just gently push it out to a trajectory that you can calculate will never strike the Earth. 
Right. And that's easy and that's, to do. And that's very easy to do. And, you, and, and we have the capability. But the important thing is that we can do this uh, by a common cooperative effort. Uh, and this is one of the things LaRouche was working back in the late 1970s and 1980s that Reagan later adopted for the Strategic Defense Initiative, was that instead of the United States and the Soviet Union at the time uh, defending themselves by threatening to annihilate each other, the best thing to do would be to cooperate and develop uh, defensive uh, weaponry, which would make it possible to render nuclear weapons obsolete. And at the time, one of the uh, collaborators of LaRouche, one of the authors of the uh, program, uh, Edward Teller, was actually saying that this could, should be the first step towards us what, uh, uh, dealing with asteroid defense. And even uh, recently in the last year, the deputy prime minister of of uh, Russia, uh, Rogovin, uh, has made this proposal, and he called it strategic defense of Earth. So the proposal is there on the table. The Russian uh, command is all for it. The American command is all for it. The only problem we got is a president who's a lunatic who will do everything he can to stop it. And if you get right, that the thing guy is out, he, ha he, he hasn't left the situation in Libya or Tunisia better either. He's got a situation now, I just saw it here, where they're now uh, shelling uh, and attacking the former Gaddafi stronghold of Bani Walid. This situation isn't stable at all. You've got 18 tribal groups fighting. You don't have a stable economy. The, the social support systems that were there, which is be the best economic social supports of any African nation, are gone. Libya now is laid bare, so is Tunisia. Uh, this is basically for the benefit of the global banksters that want to cut the, the spigot off for oil, especially starting a regional war in the Middle East at a time when we're having brought on the Liberty Rig or the Bakken, which, of course, Obama has opposed uh, licensing on federal lands, the the, uh, the XL pipeline from Canada, drilling off of Alaska, and licenses off Louisiana and Virginia. It's just sickening for him to, to lie with his eyes popping on that debate last night saying that he did something when in fact he did the exact opposite. Absolutely. He, he bankrolled. Well, that's what Obama is. He's a liar. And, and, he bankrolled and, and, and supporters you, of his program with quote green energy, which was a black hole of, of outdated technology and people just trying to get other, uh, uh, you know, completely different things. For example, T Boone Pickens when he tried to put all these these windmills up, he was specifically buying the land or getting access to the land sometimes through eminent domain to get control of the water of the aquifer underneath the windmills right. through, the, through the Midwest. So we're not talking about, you know, rational development of alternative energy. And I know there's some new ones. We've got V3 Solar that will be coming on. I'll bring them on next year. We've got uh, Zena Solar out of Israel. We've got all kinds of other technologies. <clears throat> but they're only going to make a small fraction of the, uh, tech, of the oil and gas. <clears throat> and instead of energy independence, Obama has, for four years, put us on hold uh, in the middle of a recession depression that could have solved the problem. Just Alaska's oil and gas would have solved and wiped out our debt. But Obama is the problem. Back in a moment. And in this last segment, uh, Bruce, uh, <clears throat> give us some highlights of the uh, Hal Gazep uh, interview and uh, much more in terms of these other topics we have posted up today. Well, what we were talking about uh, earlier about the danger of war, this is, uh, uh, as you aptly put it, I mean, the, the, the human race has come to the point where war is no longer a way we can solve crises. With, with the level of technology of mankind reaching uh, thermonuclear capability, uh, and there is no war that that, that ever uh, doesn't go to the most advanced level of technology. If you have a war, sooner or later it leads to thermonuclear war. So, so we and if you think about the last 120, 130 years, we've been in a continuous state of war. You've had sometimes uh, uh, armistice and peace uh, uh, truces, or the war has been limited to regional areas, but. We've been in a continuous state of war with two big eruptions into World War, third one if you count the Cold War, and that has to end. So well, we're actually in the economic phase of World War III now, 
People need to recognize there's multiple phases to war. And right now we're what's called going from the economic to the proxy war phase. The economic phase started back in the late 90s. We're now moving into the proxy war phase with the so-called Arab Spring, I call it the Arab Winter which is all pushed by the bankers because their schemes on their economic front is not working and they want to create a whole new game and this means that they want World War III and Obama is their proxy for helping push that, isn't it? Absolutely, so there's a, there's a forum that was started by the uh, head of the Russian Railways Association, Vladimir Yakunin which was uh, uh, started ten years ago to provide an annual meeting in Rhodes, uh, the island of Rhodes uh, where people from all over the world get together and discuss uh, the common interests of mankind. And Helga LaRouche has been invited to this, uh, and Linda LaRouche was invited one year uh, to give a, a talk, and they've, they, they've gone several times. But this year uh, she was uh, put in a prominent position. To, she actually gave the final presentation, the closing presentation to the conference. There are about 550 people there from all over the world, from every religious group, every ethnic group, every nation, and so forth and she raised this issue she said we're, we're at a point just the one that you and I were talking about that we're at a point where mankind is on the verge of thermonuclear war and we have to uh, pull back from that brink and the only way to pull back from that brink is to come to the realization that war is no longer a way to solve the problems of mankind and we have to unite together for the common aims of mankind no we have to realize there's what I call level three weapons and level three weapons include thermonuclear but America as well as four other nations have weather weapons. America and Russia have geotectonic weapons that can trigger earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. Literally control the planet. We call level one, as Michio Kako says, uh, energetic technology. Level two is you control a star. Level three is you control the power of a black hole in a, in a galaxy. What that means is we're at a level where because we have scalar weapons, we know the Iranian and Syrian biological weapons program was transplanted from Russia in the, after Glasnost and Perestroika. They have the largest deposit of RDX and VX nerve gas outside the United States. And yet we want to inflame the situation and hand it over to someone who we know is stable, who's an eye doctor, Bashar Assad, who's absolutely trying to defend his regime, which, by the way, defends Christians and Jews and others in the country. When the Assyrian Free Army comes, they're burning down Christian churches, sometimes 2,000 years old. As we speak, this is happening. And Obama is directly responsible for the cleansing of what we call the Saturday people, okay, and the Sunday people. What it means is they want to get rid of, with the rise of the caliphate of the Salafi Muslim Brotherhood, they want to get rid of Christians and Jews in these areas, and of course we know that what happens always, we had talked to Akual Razuli and other experts like Theodore Shubat and Walid Shubat on the show, this always means collapse of their economy. So between speculation on the commodities market, which, which caused a lot of the so-called Arab Spring because the people were starving in these countries like Egypt and Libya, what's going to happen is with Obama's policies in QE3 from Bernanke, you're going to see mass starvation in 2013, 2014 between that and the climate change that's causing crop collapse. So Obama's inflaming the situation and trying to push for a thermonuclear war, which is mass worldwide genocide. Absolutely. And that's where we, and yet we're on the verge where mankind has the technology uh, already to uh, provide enough food for the entire world's population. And to easily, to, easily. And yeah. to provide, you know, so. This is really where we are. We're so close to being able to come together, uh, not in one world. Uh, no, uh, uh, a, a collective of, na of separate sovereign nations that Absolutely. have a global viewpoint toward collaborative projects where war is now obsolete. And like the in front of the United Nations building, and it comes right out of the quote of the Bible, it says they shall hammer their weapons of war into plowshares. Well, guess what? It's plowshare time. Because Absolutely. even proxy wars are obsolete. Economic wars are obsolete. And what's happening is our country thinks it's fine. QE3 is a form of economic warfare on the rest of the world, isn't it? QE3 well, is, is economic where, warfare. This is where, this is where uh, the issue comes, is how do you actually educate people? And uh, LaRouche is fond of quoting the poet, Percy Bysshe Shelley who wrote a, uh, an essay called In Defense of Poetry, in which he talks about how most of the time, most of the people really don't, don't respond to the kinds of things you and I have been discussing this afternoon. Right. But in a period of crisis, you actually, a small number of people can actually motivate 
uh, large uh, masses of people. And in, and in the history of the United States, our great leaders, when well, we've had great leaders, have been able to do that. How does a Lincoln or a Washington or a JFK or a Roosevelt uh, able to mobilize the population to to rise to the occasion and do something that they otherwise wouldn't be able to do on their own? And it's not because they uh, have a particular plan or a set of rules or a set of legislations, but they use they use what what an artist would call the poetic principle. They use the power of the mind to convey ideas from one mind to another in the way a poet does that. The, the, yeah. the meaning that's of why the first, by the way, that they that's why the first people that are killed by revolutionaries, like in Russia or China or anywhere, is they want to kill the poets. The yeah. comedians and the visionaries that give, like the prophets, they give a vision of what you can have. It says, my people perish for lack of vision. You get a vision through comedy, through poetry, through music, and through people that prophesy and tell you, this is what you can have. You can have a planet free of objects that could smash into your planet and destroy it, or protect it with hardened systems so that the coronal mass ejection will crash your, your satellite networks and your ground-based uh, power distribution networks, and you can develop tokamak fusion reactors and space-based uh, programs to completely revolutionized so there's limitless energy for the population limitless access to information and education no starvation anywhere systems that allow sovereign nations to have safety and security without the fear the constant fear of not just nuclear warfare scalar warfare biological weapons warfare terrorism all these things which have been weapons not by the rogue terrorists but by government to hammer the population into submission well, and that's where that's where this question of poetry comes in again. We we as a small group have to be able to inspire these this this better nature because the future never comes out of the trends of the past. The future comes as something new, and that's what it, what you have to do is organize the present uh, with the idea of uh, having been inspired from the future. And if you look at the speech of JFK, the famous one where he called for putting a man on the moon within the decade, you see that he was evoking the future and inspiring a nation to bring out of its present something from the future. This yeah. is what people have to look at today. And we right. are on the verge of being able to do that. LaRouche is a, is a 90-year-old man, but he's, he's a man who has led his whole life in this standpoint. He's been able to inspire many people. Helga LaRouche did the same thing at this conference in Rhodes. And uh, the American people have to uh, start looking to that right now. Uh, and more and more people are. As they get the, uh, as the reality sinks in that this is a matter not of uh, uh, times getting less bad or more bad, but a time of either extinction or progress. I think, yeah, it, uh, in other words, it's, so we're on the crossroads, like the, uh, the story about the devil went down to Georgia, you know, in that song. Uh, we're down basically at the crossroads. We can decide to have a civilization where we have extended human lifespan, a safe world. We can have real economies that are new kinds of economies where no one starves. Everybody has what I call employment rather than employment, where there's no limit uh, of energy access. We don't have to worry about starvation. We don't have to constantly worry about terrorism or being abused at TSA. That we can have a safe world that deals with all these issues, but we haven't got a vision. And with Obama, God knows before the election now, because uh, we could have an October surprise if he thinks he's losing in the polls. Because I know they tried to massage it, that he won the debate. He lost hands down. Anybody that has two clues, we don't have a prancing rooster there with Obama. We have a <laughs> empty suit who's putting us in grave danger, and he has no plans for the next four years other than war and economic policies that fail and taxation of the very people that can generate more jobs and alienate our potential allies and aggravate our potential enemies into a conflict that we can't win. Amazing, isn't it? Yep. Thank you, Bruce. Uh, amazing. Uh, Bruce, director from LaRouche Foundation, LaRouchePAC.com, the number 800-922-2907.